Uh, good morning. My name is Stephen Firth. I'm the manager from Mono manager of Monash Microimaging, the optical microscopy core facility for Monash University. And to start this morning's sessions, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations where Monash University is situated here in Clayton. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. This morning we have Dr. Fabian Voigt with his talk entitled Expanding the Optical Bag of Tricks for Neuroscience. And Dr. Voigt has been a Human Frontier Science Program postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Florian Ingert at Harvard University and works on improving whole brain imaging techniques in larval zebrafish. Today, he will tell us about Mesospim, his open source light sheet microscope and novel multi-immersion objectives. Thank you very much for agreeing to speak this morning for us, Fabian, and over to you. Yeah, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Um, <clears throat> So please let me know if there's any issue with the audio or um, screen. So yeah, it's awesome to um, you know joining you today from um, from Boston. So for me, it's seven p.m. I don't have a beautiful morning like you do. Um, and what I'm going to be talking to you today about is basically trying to find ways of imaging cleared samples. And the over the past couple of years, there has been kind of a big evolution in terms of clearing techniques and. Um, we have kind of an you know ongoing increase in the size of these samples. So here's just some examples of like a mouse brain it's a sample I would consider pretty standard, um, and then you know a chicken embryo which is roughly two and a half centimeters in size at nine days old, and then a um, <clears throat> a fourteen or two week old mouse which you can see is like seven eight centimeters, and if you reach this kind of sample size, then it already becomes a little bit difficult to find a microscope for that. And the two projects I'm going to be talking about kind of try to address these, um, you know, the, the challenge of imaging such samples from like different angles. And um, one of them is the uh, the Mesospim initiative. So that's an open hardware project aimed at um, making, basically providing blueprints, instructions, software for building a light sheet microscope. And then the, the system on the right is going to be about like a little bit of, a, I would say, um, um, uncommon kind of approach to build microscope objectives, but also oriented towards providing very high data quality out of clear tissue. So um, the uh, modalities that I'll be using in the, for the mesospin, this is light sheet microscopy, which I'm assuming like many of you are very, very familiar with. Just one tiny little you know, comment regarding light sheet. In my view, there's like two big worlds of light sheet microscopy. And it basically the big dividing line is the sample size. So if you do live imaging, like for instance, imaging like a developing zebrafish or like um, <clears throat> Drosophila embryo, then uh, you usually deal with a sample on a millimeter scale. If you have cleared samples, and we talk about really large samples, like the you know many centimeters in size that I've shown you. And the big you know difference is that you know as your sample grows, your kind of microscope has to grow with it. So at some point, kind of the this is the objective working distances that you use in a classical light sheet microscope for developmental imaging become limiting for clear tissue imaging. That's why I think there's like two worlds. And if you try to optimize for both at the same time, then usually either one, uh, you know, doesn't work so well. So you can't have, you know, perfect imaging conditions for both in my view. Now, um, there's for the specific approach, like for imaging clear tissue, there's many, many like, you know, ways of building these light sheet microscopes. Basically, it's like the ways how you surround the sample with you know, excitation and detection objectives so that the sample doesn't have any privacy at all. And, um, you know, one approach is basically to have illumination from the two sides that helps you to kind of deal with the inhomogeneity of the tissue that might have a gradient of how well your light sheet penetrates and you you have, um, it's just like, you know, on one side it's much weaker than on the other side because it gets absorbed inside the sample or scattered. Um, and you can then, you know, try to homogenize it a little bit by illuminating from two sides. And um, the other big change is kind of how, you know, what, what orientation of your detection axis you have. It can be horizontal, you can be vertical. Um, and then, of course, it can be tilted in these kind of open top or like ice beam configurations. And in the tilted configuration, then usually these are really optimal for imaging slab like samples. But for imaging a sample, like for instance, the mouse embryo that I've shown you, um, um, sorry, the, the two week old mouse, that's a, that's a different kind of thing because then the sample is actually also pretty, pretty deep in a way. And then it, such a geometry also becomes limiting. 
Um, and so the Mises spin basically is a kind of scaled up version of the like horizontal um, excitation and detection path. And you can go to the website mesospim.org and kind of find an overview of the project. And then we have a GitHub repository with a wiki that provides you instructions on how to build the system and uh, software. And basically the software is written in Python and is basically doing the data acquisition and like, uh, you know, acquisitions, tiling, sample rotation, all that kind of stuff. And the, the microscope then looks like this. So if you're not used to like custom microscopes, it looks like a... Um, <clears throat> You know, giant mess of like uh, you know tall labs and other parts. Basically, we have like the sample hanging from above in these sample stages. The sample goes you know in a, potentially in like a little cuvette that kind of hangs from the top, and then um, you have an excitation pass on the right and on the left. And basically, we can support large samples because we have a lot of travel range here, and we have objectives with long working distances for excitation and detection. And then, if you, for instance, put a, a chicken embryo in, inside that uh, microscope, you get a data set like this. So there's a seven day old chicken embryo, a bit younger than the one I've shown you. And uh, here like we have a neurofilament staining. So parts of the developing nervous system are stained. In this case, that's a tiled acquisition that is roughly, uh, if I remember correctly, is roughly 1.1 terabyte in size. It took roughly three hours to acquire. And you have here like a voxel sampling of roughly um, on the order of one by one by three micron. And um, yeah, so that's kind of the, you know, um, data quality you can get out of the system. And currently there's roughly, this number is actually not, not accurate anymore. I just checked the wiki and we're actually now at like 24 mesospins. And uh, they kind of distribute a little bit of the, of the globe. The, the majority of systems is in Europe and, and, and within Europe and Switzerland where the project originated and in Zurich, for instance, where I did my PhD. There's a couple of systems in the US um, and the, the system closest to you is actually based in Singapore and there's also a growing number of systems in China. And um, these setups, they have uh, basically, th th there's something which I feel like we are very, very lucky about because one of the challenges in developing open source hardware is the um, problem of like, how do you provide long-term support? How do you, you know, keep the software up to date? And that's something where it's actually like with many funding agencies, it's like something which is, you know, a little bit harder to find funding for. And uh, in my former laboratory, my, my former boss and PhD supervisor, Fritjof Hampton, we got very, very lucky in being able to make the Mesospin part of a research priority project at the University of Zurich. And this allowed us to hire Nikita Vladimirov, who since um, two years ago is basically like a Mesospin core developer and also like community manager. And he basically then has, has taken on this role. And now he's like the, the funding will run for many more years and he'll be able to provide, you know, continuously software updates and so on. So I see my role as the one who kind of started that project is more like I'm kind of the ambassador in, in North America, especially, um, and, and try to, you know, provide a little bit local support here. And Nikita is the one who has more like the, you know, uh, the 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 day to day job is actually running the project and, and pushing the envelope on what's possible with light sheet imaging for clear tissue. And over the past couple of years, the the thing that's kind of you know for me, um, you know, the most important thing about like building these custom setups is that they get used to to do biology, right? And so we've been you know being able to collaborate with a wide variety of people who've been you know the, the, one of the fun things about this is that the wide variety of people like who come with cleared samples like. For instance, um, one of the systems that is in an imaging facility in Geneva was used to look at cysts that are um, associated with infection um, by this bacterium Toxoplasma gondii, which is like a very weird infection where actually the bacterium is able to change the behavior of the mouse. And so it's very interesting kind of how such a, like one of the simple, like one of the impacts of this um, uh, infection kind of spreads through the brain. And that's something that's a project where, for instance, clear tissue imaging is perfect because you can look at a lot of samples. And, um, but the resolution you need is like, you don't need like sub micron, you know, level resolution to visualize these cysts. So you, also have you know data sets that are very reasonable quality. And in within neuroscience, a lot of the projects revolve around like for instance tracing neurons like in like via rabies tracing or like via uh, more classical viral injections. And for me, it's always, you know, again, fun to see when, you know, stuff pops up where I'm like, oh, they actually used a mesospin for this. And something that actually happened just a week ago was there was a paper uh, that came out in communications biology by Marie Dash, who was um, 
and, and co-workers who are at the Vision Institute in Paris, and they actually um, were able to clear human eyes, um, which for those people among you who have not worked with like human tissue, so, and especially like, you know, tissue from eyes, is like something that's super hard because eyes have lots of pigments and getting rid of them and being able to actually, you know, achieve a nice sample while, you know, being able to immunostain it well is something super challenging. And so that was super interesting for me to see. And I'm just playing the videos here. So um, this is like part of the supplementary videos. It's beautiful, like showing the the iris and, and um, the uh, basically the muscles around the uh, the iris that would you know lead to the the contraction. I should say in this case they were actually not able. They had to remove the lens because they were not able. So basically the lens when trying these clearing approaches it turned opaque, and so the the lens is missing from that kind of you know volume. But still this is also an example where the you know being able to see the sample and like the full context in three D is something just you know in my view it's just you know gorgeous data. And this is like the most fun thing about such a project that suddenly people do stuff which you never imagined would have been possible um now one of the key things in like in, in like mesosperm data acquisition is that we really try to work very hard on getting good data quality and it turns out in the light sheet microscopes one of the biggest determinants is like how well how, how thin can you make the light sheet how uniform can you make it across the field of view and the technique i'm using and the mesosperm is something that was developed in the lab of uh, Reto Fjolka uh, at UT Southwestern a couple of years ago, and it's called axially swept light sheet microscopy. And basically, the idea is in a typical light sheet microscope, you have this kind of trade off between the thinner you try to make the beam waste, the shorter the range over which the waste is actually like has a has a reasonably you know thin um, you know. Um, Axial sectioning capability. So to provide some numbers, um, like for instance, if you try to reach like a sub four micron light sheet thickness, then the region where the light sheet stays like within, let's say, five micron or so is only like 120 microns in size. Now the brain is like a centimeter wide. So if you only have a strip that's 120 micron wide within that, that has really good axial resolution, then you know you can imagine you need a lot of tiling in order to um you know, cover this whole sample with uniform axial resolution. And basically the idea is in, in axially swept light sheet microscopy is to do the tiling during the acquisition. And that's the way that works is by making use of the rolling shutters that modern cameras have. And you can synchronize this rolling shutter by with the movement of the light sheet waste. So you sweep the light sheet through the sample. This is done using a tunable lens, an electrically tunable lens that you can just control via a current. And you synchronize this with the rolling shutter of the camera, and as a result, the 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 data looks as if it's been produced with a light sheet that is basically just a perfect thin light sheet across the whole field of view. Um, what we're usually aiming for is uh, something on the order of like 3.5 micron for with half maximum across like 10 millimeters or so. Um, but the the actual values depend a little bit on like which clearing technique, which immersion medium you're using. And now to, to illustrate what the impact of this kind of, you know, sweeping versus non-sweeping is. So um, this is an example of a, a mouse brain and it's a coronal, you know, view of the mouse brain, but it, the data was actually acquired in the horizontal plane. So you see basically the data was acquired from the top to bottom, but then we look at the whole data set from the side. And each of these little uh, white dots is, a, is, in this case, a VIP interneuron, in the, which are predominantly in the cortex of the outer layers of the, like the outer part of the mouse brain. And um, the, um, as you can see on the, on the left and on the right, the, each cell kind of gets, you know, kind of blurred into this like a long elongated streak. And that's basically the light sheet is thicker there. So um, the, uh, you know, the cell appears in many more Z sections than it would be uh, if it would be in the waste location, which is here close to the midline. And so this is what the data looks like if this ASLM mode is off. And then this is what happens if you turn it on. And it's basically such a striking difference in data quality and kind of at this resolution. So we're talking like six micron, sorry, sampling, six micron isotropic sampling. It's something where people basically never want to turn this mode off. And so it's kind of in the mesosperm, it's it's in the software, it's on by default in a way. On a, on a level of the whole data set, this is what it looks like. So that's the same kind of sample. There's now the whole data, but with this ASLM mode off. 
And if you switch the mode on, then this mouse brain turns into like a nice galaxy of um, uh, um, these interneurons. And that's kind of also what you want. This is you want, you know, similar extra resolution throughout the whole sample in order to, you know, make your segmentation easy and you don't have to kind of tune your, um, you know, potentially parameters across the feed of you. And the cool thing is this also totally helps you if you're imaging, you know, if you zoom in a little bit, the original Mises BIM had like a zoom function. Um, so we this is like a data set acquired at 4x magnification and these are neurons in the um, layer five of the cortex and these are the axons that I kind of go to like the you know the spinal cord and deeper parts of the brain you can see with this mode is on you can you know see individual axons but if the mode is off it's basically just a massive blur so this is one of those data sets where you know there's no point in not acquiring data with uniform extra resolution if you if you can do that now, something we've been doing, as I said, Nikita um, especially has been pushing the like we, um, you know, the 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 family. Basically, we have an expanding family of mesospin microscopes, and one of the things that I noted was um, something that turned out to be a tiny bit of a challenge for the, um, adopters was that. Um, the the mesospin, the original one, kind of fills half of an optical table, and an optical table is something that um, you know people can somehow squeeze in their lab if necessary. But also, oftentimes, their laser safety you know officers would then you know in, make it you know necessary or like it would be a good requirement to put the microscope in a dedicated room. And if you do not have like a facility you can place your system in, then the problem is that you know where do you get this room, especially like if you're a young PI or so. And then and uh, the idea was then, okay, what if we can like reduce the footprint of this microscope? And this was the benchtop mesospin that um, the first version of, of that I built in like 2019, but then, you know, development has been continuing and now um, we've been releasing it um, a couple of months ago. And this microscope is basically then half the size, but the cool thing is we kind of retain the ability to image samples that are the same size as the big brother. Um, and also we've been able to kind of push, uh, you know, the resolution a little bit. And so there's a preprint now on, on BioArchive. Um, and also we have the whole like documentation uh, on GitHub as well. So um, here's some examples of like the, the range, you know, of, of magnifications and the range of samples that we've uh, been imaging with the, with the bench job. So one is the whole mouse. I'm going to show you some more data on this later on. But you can also like image a whole, you know, in this case, the disco cleared mouse brain that was provided by Ali Atuk's lab. And, um, <clears throat> you know, see neurons and individual dendrites of course one of the big mainstays is like whole brain imaging and, and you know also imaging whole um you know whole embryos like this chicken embryo i showed you earlier and um here's an example now of this like whole brain data set the, the typical data size of something like this is like roughly 60 70 gigabytes per channel we acquire such a data set in like seven eight minutes per color channel and here this labeling of like everything in green is an amyloid beta plug and a mouse model of alzheimer's disease and in magenta you can see the um arteries which are there's an antibody standing for smooth muscle actin so that's a very typical data set and then the 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 nice thing about the um <clears throat> um you know, we, we found like a machine vision objective that allows us to image such a sample in a single feed of view at roughly 3.5 micron voxel size. Um, and this allows us to, so we have one, one image is basically 50 megapixels in size. So this allows us to, you know, have very, very good sampling for like, you know, for instance, counting cells or like in this case, counting plaques, but you don't need any tiling at all. And so this is really useful for projects where you need to go through lots and lots of samples. Um, and regarding the the whole brain, uh, sorry, the whole mouse imaging, here's an example of how we do this. So the first thing is how do you actually mount such a sample? My preferred way is actually to just put it in a cuvette. The cuvettes we're using are custom made. So this kind, this one is, for instance, like twenty by twenty by ten centimeters, sorry, hundred millimeters, and we just clamp it into like a prism holder from Torlabs, and then the mesospin sample holders are magnetic and can kind of click the sample into the um, <clears throat> into the microscope and then in this case if you want to do multi-view imaging you could only do it from like the four views you don't want to look through the corner 
Um, but the um, you know the nice thing is that this makes it super easy um, to, for instance, you know, image the sample at low resolution, take it out, uh, you know, then somebody else can use the microscope where you have a look at the data and you you kind of check, for instance, what are the interesting ROIs that say there's a tumor you're really interested in, and then you put the sample back in and then you can kind of you know have a registered view at higher resolution, for instance, but you don't need to you know this this kind of ability to image the same sample multiple times can really help you um, you know streamlining your experiments or like also you know just just checking for data quality and this is like a just a um, data set now from taken from a single uh, view this is the same sample and this is just the order fluorescence from the mostly from the fixation of the animal so you can see internal organs you know part of the part of the skeleton and, and so so these data um, sets tend to be I would say very rich and it's also a little bit of a problem like for instance if you have lots of these different like cleared mice how do you actually put them into a common reference frame and it's something where the Adtok lab is working on software tools to do that and so we have this gigantic you know in this case like roughly 50 by 50 by 100 millimeter travel range to accommodate samples and so one of the things was if we have this travel range that is useful for large samples we can also put in lots of small samples and just you know for instance rotate them into the field of view and this is something we call the SPIM tower. So it's basically like a stackable multi-sample holder. And in this case, this was for a project where collaborators wanted to image lots and lots of tiny little tadpoles, each of which is like four millimeters in size. And um, the idea was to make a mold and then put the tadpoles in this agarose block. So it kind of sticks out in this kind of T-shaped, you know, in the, in the bottom of the T in a way. And then each of the agarose blocks goes into one of these like slots. And then each of these, um, you know, levels is magnetic and you can kind of stack them and then attach them to the rotation stage of the microscope. And then you just kind of rotate them in the, in the field of view which is something you know every individual data acquisition here because the stack is the sample is so small the acquiring the stack only takes a few minutes so if you had to image the samples one by one you would be constantly you know spend more time taking the samples in and out than actually imaging them and here you can for instance you know, set up an acquisition of like, uh, you know, up to probably like 20 or so samples and then just run it for a couple of hours. And so this is like one application where we use the huge travel range to kind of accommodate more samples. Um, but of course, in order to make this work, you kind of need to have like, um, you know, everything, like for instance, there has to be a good protocol for like placing the samples in very similar locations and stuff like that, which in the case of the tadpoles work, you know, beautifully. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like an overview of the Mesospin project at the at the current stage. And, you know, it kind of also illustrates a little bit what, you know, the, when people were bugging me about when, like, you know, looking at Mesospin data is like, you know, in a sample like this, how can you then, you know, you get overview data, you have maybe, you know, voxel size of, you know, on the order of like, but usually above a micron. But if you want to do a bit more, you know, high resolution imaging in these large samples, how do you actually do that? And so um, having a bit of a background in optical design, I've been thinking a lot about like how to build microscope objectives for imaging clear tissue. And uh, this is what resulted in a project I call the Schmidt objective. And um, basically the overarching question is what, what makes, you know, this, this building microscope objectives for clear tissue especially challenging is that we have this gigantic range of, indices of immersion media with different you know optical properties we need to accommodate because ideally you do not want to have a full lineup of objectives ideally you want to have one objective that can image in water but also in organic solvents with an index of 1.56 and if you look at like the design of commercial microscope objectives achieving that even at for like more like overview like lower magnifications in this case this is a 10x from olympus is pretty expensive and also the tolerances you need to um, you know achieve like some of the air gaps in this optical design are thinner than the thickness of a human hair so it's a very challenging you know thing to build something like this that's why these um, objectives tend to be very very expensive and so the question is well can we you know take a step back and like rethink a little bit how to build microscope objectives for this specific application and maybe come up with a different solution so kind of my my design brief or the specifications I was after was that I wanted a large field of view because you know cleared samples tend to be large so you don't want to do too much tiling and um, you want to have a numerical aperture above 0.7 that's a bit of an arbitrary criterion but basically I wanted to do better than this Olympus objective and a large working distance there I also like 
a centimeter is an arbitrary criterion, but I, in this case, I also I wanted to beat this the eight millimeters here, and it should be all media, which actually this one cannot do. It kind of only goes from like water to I think one point five one, um, and so you know let's let's kind of take a little bit of a step back and, and revisit like geometric optics a little bit because what I'm going to show you is actually something that is basically fully based on like very like you know just geometrical optics. There's nothing fancy in there. Um, so, you know, when a ray hits an interface, it gets refracted. And basically, this law of refraction, you know, you have this combination of the refractive index times the sine of the angle, you know, this is what makes optical design hard, because there's like two nonlinearities here. So one is that your dispersion, your the, the index depends on your wavelength in a nonlinear manner. And then, of course, the sine is a nonlinear function. And this is basically, you know, Beating that kind of thing, this, this is what makes optical design hard. But there's kind of an edge case of the law of refraction, which sounds in a way, you know, why, why should you even think about it? And it's like, let's say we are at normal incidence. We have a ray that's hitting the um, the interface at an uh, you know angle of 90 degrees. And we have this index step here. Well, then the ray doesn't get refracted. So it just, you know, continues straight through. And this is kind of boring because if you want to build a microscope objective with this, you know, there is an interesting property here, which is if you now change the index, let's say you go from whatever, air to water, the ray still doesn't get refracted, right? So it's, it's still, you know, just continues on its way. But the thing is, because the ray doesn't change direction, per definition, such a surface doesn't have any optical power. So you cannot use it to focus light. So in a way, this is like nice, but completely useless um, as a primary approach to build such an objective. However, you know, there's also something else. There's reflection and reflection has a very interesting property, which is that, you know, you have your ray bouncing off the mirror and the angle of incidence equals the angle of, you know, after the reflection. However, the cool thing is this doesn't depend on your index. You can change the index and it's still, you know, the ray doesn't change its direction. And if the ray doesn't change its direction, it kind of means that you also do not generate any additional aberrations, which in turn means if you build a microscope objective kind of completely out of mirrors, and then you take this kind of mirror design and you immerse it in a liquid medium, then you will still get a sharp image. And that's kind of the, the core idea I'm after here. Now, um, there's actually a system in nature which is very, very, you know, using that kind of trick, and that's what you can see here. So, you know, this is like, you know, a diver diving along, and then look, there's a scallop, and you can see the scallop is, you know, basically spots the diver and is escaping, and then at some point it's going to settle on the ocean floor. So what you've seen here is, you know, scallops have eyes, they're able to detect uh, like a predator. And one of the cool things about scallops is that they have lots and lots of eyes. So each of these beautiful blue dots you can see in this image is an individual eye. So they have like a 60, you know, a set of 60 or 100, um, you know, <clears throat> different eyes, each of which is like roughly like um, on the order of three or 500 micron in size. And if you if you zoom in, then, you know, at first sight, these eyes look kind of completely like, you know, maybe like a vertebrate eye. However, if you were to cut them in half, they have a completely different kind of layout. And that is, yes, there is a lens and the, the rays kind of pass through the lens and get slightly refracted. However, then the light actually passes through the layer of photoreceptors and bounces off as like a like a hemispherical mirror. So the thing that actually creates most of the optical power in this tiny little optical system is actually a curved mirror. And the space between mirror and the photoreceptors and the lens is filled with a liquid. So it's actually an immersed mirror system, which, you know, nature, you know, for, for imaging, which nature came up with like 50 million years ago or so. And so Something like this exists in optics, and uh, but in a totally different domain, and that is namely astronomy. And so he, that thing is called the Schmidt Telescope, which is named after an optical designer who came up with this idea. And so the, the basic idea of a Schmidt Telescope is the following. You take a spherical mirror, and if you just take a spherical mirror by itself, um, there's something really annoying, which is, you know, the rays do not come to a common focus. So that's called spherical aberration. Um, and the, the big challenge here is like, if you want to get rid of those in order to build a telescope, because otherwise your, you know, image of a star is horribly smeared out. And the way Schmidt approached this was to put a so-called correction plate in front of the, the mirror, and then 
shape the correction plate in a very specific way. So it's in so-called asphere, so the design doesn't follow like a spherical surface. Instead, it's like a combination. You can think of it like two lenses in one. At the outer part, in the outer zones, it's like a negative lens. It diverges the ray path a little bit. And then the inner part is like a positive lens, so it actually converges the beam a little bit. And the combined action of both kind of brings all the rays into a common focus. And I should say these animations were done by, by Lashlan Whitehead, who's based in Melbourne, and I guess you, many of you know, and so I, I, a big shout out to him for um, creating all the supplementary videos for me. Now, um, basically, then the idea is to take this optical design and say, okay, what can we do um, in order to turn this now into an immersion objective? And the, the basic approach is, well, we just, you know, fill the entire system with a liquid. And so now what I've shown you earlier is if you have a mirror and it's in touch with the liquid, then, well, it should provide a sharp image, right? In that case, that doesn't quite happen. And the, the big challenge is that there's some additional refraction occurring at this interface between the glass correction plate and the liquid. And we can now use the little additional trick that I've shown you. We kind of locally deform the surface and we deform it in a way that locally all the rays are at normal incidence. And so this means whatever the index step, the ray or the wavefront doesn't get kind of, you know, distorted or the rays don't get refracted at that point. Another way of describing this is that this at this location inside the optical system, the actual shape of the surface is exactly, you know, the same as the wavefront. Um, and then this, in, this system is basically something a little bit weird because the usual distinction between an immersion and an air objective doesn't apply here anymore. It works in air, it delivers a sharp image, and it can you know, use a completely different medium, let's say some horrible green goo, and it will still deliver a sharp image, um, as long as the medium is homogeneous. And so that's the kind of you know conceptual um, approach, and I should say the um, one of the aspects of a Schmidt telescope, and this also applies to the Schmidt microscope object, is that the image play, or the image surface is slightly curved, and this is like due to the symmetry of the spherical mirror. Um, now, basically, what I decided to do after like you know, you know, thinking about this design was to say, okay, this is something really interesting. We should turn into a microscope objective because it has far fewer you know elements than a normal uh, objective. And so um, I decided to build a two-photo microscope with it. And so the real two-photo microscope looks something like this. So there's like a chamber and the correction plate goes into like a window location. And then we have the mirror and then we put the sample in between correction plate and mirror. And then the whole thing gets filled with a liquid. And the entire assembly is basically where like in a to photo microscope, your objective would go, and it's a custom to photo microscope. It's but it's like conceptually exactly the same as a normal to photo microscope. So it has some beam expanders, laser. There's some scan mirrors which are you know scanning the beam across the the sample. Um, we then you know the beam after the scan mirrors gets expanded, and you know there's a scan and tube lens combination, and we go into the objective. So the only special thing here is that the whole microscope is basically horizontal in order to make the liquid exchange a little bit easier. And um, and then you know we generate fluorescence light um, inside the sample by to photon excitation, and we detect this with some photomultipliers. So again, like a completely standard to photon microscope. Now, um, one little comment here regarding the optical design. So I've been using a spherical mirror here, and not a parabolic mirror. And I can say, well, actually, a spherical mirror has spherical aberration, but a parabolic mirror doesn't. So why aren't you using a parabolic mirror? And here's the reason why. One of the things that Schmidt realized when designing the Schmidt telescope is that actually the amount of spherical aberration, kind of the way the rays, you know, miss each other in a way, it's exactly the same if you're on axis versus if you're off axis. So if you have a bundle that's, you know, hitting the, the mirror at an angle, if you have a parabolic mirror, that's not the case. So on axis, you have a perfect image, but then off axis, you have a horrible degradation of your image quality by another aberration that's coma. And so you would have a much smaller feed of view, um, you know, when you were using a parabolic mirror, I mean, a feed of view over which you have good image quality compared to using a spherical mirror, because the cool thing about the spherical mirror is that one shape of the correction plate can kind of correct the spherical aberration on axis and also pretty far off axis without having to do any like, you know, um, adaptation for where you are in the feed of view. So this kind of the concept of the whole microscope, the actual kind of cross section of the system looks something like this. So the, this thing is the correction plate, but you see if you were to like, look at it from the side, the actual curvature of the surface is very, very slim. And um, this objective has now the interesting property that 
the numerical aperture depends on index. And I told you the system works in air. And so we have a certain numerical aperture in air, but then as we go in, let's say, into water, our numerical aperture increases, and that's simply because we increase the index. So in a way, you gain resolution simply by filling in a you know liquid with a higher or like a different index. And uh, in this case, the design goes up to any 1.08 and like organic solvents with 1.56. And so this system, as you can see it here, is optimized for multi-photon imaging. And the reason is, you know, for an optical designer, I only have two elements here, right? So there's basically the correction plate and the mirror. And so there's no, you know, means of like color correcting here. So the system in a way, in a, in a strict sense, only works at a single wavelength. and that is something in the two photon microscope. If you have a single excitation, you know, the, your laser is tuned, let's say, whatever, to 920 nanometers for GFP or like GCAMP. Um, you don't care what happens, you know, in other wavelengths because as long as you can focus, you know, this light at like 920 plus minus, plus minus a few nanometers um, sharply onto your sample, you will get good image quality. And so this means that like building the system as a multi photon objective was kind of the simplest way of actually trying this idea out in real life. Um, and the interesting thing is then the diffraction limited field of view of this system now as a two photon objective is actually pretty large. It's far larger than, you know, common, you know, commercial microscope objectives you can buy. It's on the order of 1.7 millimeters in air, but it's still 1.1 millimeters in a medium at an index of 1.56. I have to apologize here. This should be, um, you know, not the, the, um, the NAs are wrong here. So it's like um, the index is 1.56, but the NA only is 1.08 at like um, an index of 1.56. Um, and the, the system has excellent, um, you know, both excellent on-axis and off-axis performance, the way, you know, as an optical designer, these are the kind of plots you would look at. Um, basically, this shows you the wavefront aberration, and you want to be low. You want to be below this magic line here. This is the diffraction limit, and so basically, this means like on axis we have like a relatively low wavefront aberration, and then it kind of at some point it crosses the um, line where you know the system becomes not diffraction limited anymore. And this is like in this case, you know, this is ECI index one point five six, where like you know on on a level of like five hundred fifty micron out in the field. So that means we have an image circle of one point one millimeters. And the system then, you know, it's one thing to have like a model and an optical design program like Xenex, but then, you know, you go and you actually build the system. Um, and there's, of course, lots of little details on how to align this. And, you know, this is actually where I spend most of my time getting this thing to run. But then you can do something which in a normal microscope objective you could never do, which is you can, you know, image, you know, um, a sample or a bead in air. And then you can kind of, you know, um, go to a higher and higher refractive index and you know image a similar bead in like a different index and you can really then see how your point spread function shrinks because you have this increase in resolution as you push the na up and um, this effect is kind of um, you know also true if you're off axis and the system as built is like it's close it's not perfectly close to this red line a red dash line which is the diffraction limited but i'm so close that if this would be like a commercial microscope objective this would be totally within tolerance and so um, you know, the system basically performs as advertised. And then, of course, um, you know, we can a little bit discuss, like, now, basically, the sample goes inside the objective. So what's the working distance here? I just, in a, in a very, like, random way, I define it as a distance. I can kind of move the sample before it would collide, like the sample holder would collide with the rim of the mirror. So that's on the order of 11 millimeter. The, the actual mirror has a radius of approximately... Um, the mirror radius is is on the order of 30 millimeters and the focal length of the mirror is 15 millimeters. So the distance between the uh, focal plane or the focal surface and the vertex of the mirror is on the order of 15 millimeters. So it's a little bit less than the, you know, so you could potentially even accommodate a sample that's like 14 millimeters deep. And But then the other thing is, of course, you know, in order for this to work, the medium has to be homogenous. If you have a medium that, let's say, has some whatever, some saturated sugar solution, then this kind of objective doesn't give you a sharp image because you, you know, you have a long path length inside this medium, and any like aberrations you accumulate by index variations, just it, you know, destroys your point spread function. And so this means, and this is a general problem. This has nothing to do with the specific objective design. But as soon as you push your working distances up, especially at high NA, you run into this issue that your medium has to be homogenous. Um, this is why, for instance, I like imaging a lot in organic solvents because they tend to be extremely homogenous. 
And then, of course, the sample kind of partially blocks the optical path. So that if you put a sample in here, if you make the sample too big, then at some point it just blocks all of the excitation light, right? So there's kind of a, you know, size. And in this case, so this microscope is kind of built so I can use scan optics that is, you know, very classical. Um, like, so I don't have to redesign the other parts of the optics. And so here I can accommodate samples of six by six millimeters, which is not a whole mouse brain, let's say. Um, if I want to accumulate a whole mouse brain, basically you would just build a scaled up version of the whole thing that's maybe like 50% bigger. And uh, this is the thing as built. And so if you were just to look at this without knowing it's a microscope objective, then it looks like some weird, maybe it's a light sheet chamber, but it's definitely not an objective. But indeed it does, uh, you know, work as an objective and it's diffraction limited or close to being diffraction limited. Maybe some practical aspects about how to use this thing. So the sample holders I'm using, these are like 3D printed and they're actually compatible with the mesospin is something I'm gonna make use of um, in some example data I'm gonna show you. And so we have like these magnetic holders and we just, you know, in this case there's like a five by five millimeter piece of human um, neocortex. And then the other question is like, okay, so you fill it with all these different liquids. How do you actually, um, you know, clean this thing? And um, in that case, the way it's, you know, it's super easy. You basically dump the contents and then you use some soap water and then you let the whole system dry. So it's actually very simple. Um, in order to make the cleaning really, really easy, the, the microscope, you, you kind of disassemble the objective in this case. So the, the mirror is not, you know, part of the chamber. And so you, you know, um, the, the, they're on a, on a different, um, you know, on different mounts, the mirror can actually be adjusted relative to the chamber. And so this was just, you know, it's not a necessity to build the system this way. It was just a way to, you know, make especially the cleaning procedure very, very easy. Because initially, for instance, I didn't know whether the mirrors would survive contact with like all these weird immersion media. It turns out they actually do. Um, and then you can image, you know, samples in air. So in this case, this is a light sheet image of like a kind of big bunch of pollen. And you can take then the same objective and like, you know, put in, let's say a cleared mouse brain sample. And then, you know, you can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, and then you will be able to image at a level where you can, you know, resolve individual spines. And so this shows this kind of in practice that, you know, you have this gigantic index range to work with. And so there's, you know, a variety of like example applications. We tried like imaging, you know, in this case, these are dopaminergic neurons in the mouse brain, where you also have like very, very nice resolution. We're able to image in human cortex samples. You know, in this case, there's an acridine orange staining. Um, so you can, again, you know, see, you know, in this case, the part of the, this is like, uh, what, like layer four or so in the, in the, in the human cortex. And we can do again like image tadpoles and now do it in a like a correlative way. So in this case, this is a tadpole imaged in the mesospin. And you can kind of see the resolution is a bit blurry. So the orange staining is, is part of the peripheral nervous system. And in gray, you see DAPI, so nuclear stain. But then if you put the same sample into the Schmidt objective, you then you know have perfect cellular resolution. And um, you know, you can in this case just the head of the um of the tadpole. You can basically then you know take an overview scan, you know, visualize it in 3D. And um, I work a little bit on vision. So of course, for me, you know, looking at eyes is very interesting. In this case, I took another kind of stack in the um you know eye of the tadpole, and you can kind of you know zoom in and then easily resolve kind of the layers of the of the developing eye, the developing eye lens and the developing photoreceptors here in orange. And so you have this kind of, you know, basically this ability to image, you know, across scales and kind of put your high resolution data sets in the context of a more low resolution overview. Of course, the low resolution overview is super fast to acquire, whereas the high resolution overview, of course, it's two photo microscope takes a bit long. And the other thing you can do, you know, you can image, of course, you know, samples in water. So there's a living zebrafish larva, and then you can also, you know, do some calcium imaging in there. So, you know, it works in water and, you know. So I'm finally coming to the end here. So there's a couple of things I would like to point out about the Schmidt objective. And this is that, let's say, if you plot, you know, if you take current generation microscope objectives, you can buy them. And you compare the working distance and the numerical aperture. And here I just use numerical aperture in air. So it's like the nominal numerical aperture at the like design medium um, divided by the design index. And, you know, so it kind of um, you know shows makes makes objectives that are designed for totally different indices a little bit more comparable, 
And the, the, the size of these kind of blobs refers to the field of view. And the interesting thing is you kind of have a bit of a boundary where currently people have been pushing the designs. And so this is like roughly at this line here. And the Schmidt objective actually exists a little bit outside of it. And so the weird thing is, why does it happen? Why, why is, um, you know, is it possible to actually go in that kind of regime? And the thing is that I'm kind of choosing very, very carefully which, you know, in a way, which aberration battle I want to fight and which one I don't want to fight. And so the the thing that I'm doing here, for instance, is that I, I actually, by using mirrors in combination with aspheres, I open up a completely different design space. Um, yeah, so if you basically, what I've shown to you is that it's actually possible to take like a concept that's basically, you know, embodied in a mollusk and turn it into a microscope. And um, what I should say as well is that, you know, the current prototype is optimized for multi-photon imaging, but the concept itself can be applicable to confocal microscopy, to light sheet microscopy. It's, it's you know, it's a general concept of using immersed mirrors, basically. And, you know, if, if I can leave you just with one thought, it's basically that objective design has a lot of unexplored design space, but it's like the, you know, it's maybe the tradition of how people build microscope objectives, but also a little bit like the, you know, the trade-offs people do when, you know, usually designing objectives, where they, you, you stay in a certain part of a, the design space and you don't explore other parts, which, you know, and, and sometimes in those other parts, you find solutions which are surprisingly simple which I believe the Schmidt objective is an example of. So, you know, but to sum everything up, so basically, yeah, you can take a mollusk, you know, combine it with some, you know, cleared imaging and, and you know, sorry, clear tissue, and you do some imaging and clear tissue. Um, so I would like to thank everybody involved in, like, realizing this project, especially my former supervisor, Fritjo Helmchen, who runs a neuroscience lab, but he still allowed me to go down this, you know, slightly crazy route of, like, building microscope objectives. Um, Nikita Vladimir, who, who is basically my successor and like running the Mesospin project. And there were lots of people who uh, helped us and provided samples. And um, yeah, finally, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm uh, happy to take questions. Oh, thank you very much for that. That was quite stunning. Um, I think I have microscope envy. Uh, Taking something from nature like that, evolutionary biology, and making an objective out of it is quite amazing. So, uh, questions from uh, our viewers, people, if you put it in the chat or if you put up your hand, I can then uh, activate your microphone. Uh, I think that amazing stuff. Now, we have a light sheet. I'll start off with a question then. We have a light sheet here, a commercial one. Our biggest issue on that, I find, is alignment and aligning the two uh, different sheets from either side. How, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that gives us some grief, but now you're adding in the mesoscope, uh, how is the alignment done to get that rolling shutter aligned with the movement of your, uh, the waist of the beam? Um, yeah, so, so there's like two things, maybe like two questions in one here. One is that you have two light sheets, right? And you have to kind of overlap them mm. and, there, our solution is basically don't. And the reason is if you go to this regime where you have like a light sheet that's ten, sub 10 micron, will with have maximum over like 10 millimeters, it turns out you should not think about it as a perfectly flat sheet. Actually, in your, in your sample, it does like this. And because there's like residual index variations inside the sample. And so you now have two sheets that are kind of sometimes overlapping and sometimes not. And so we, strongly suggest to, you know, if you run the microscope in that mode, then, you know, only use single-sided illumination. Like, you know, if you're zoomed in, pick the side which has, you know, better image quality, shorter path into the sample. Now, regarding your um, second question is like, how do we actually synchronize um, like this? How, how does it work? And um, Nikita implemented a very simple way of doing this in the software, which basically what we're doing is the light sheet is generated by Galdo. And we switch the Galbo scan off. So at this point, we just have a line. And if the, the tunable end sweep and the rolling shutter are synchronized, this line aside is, is completely like has um, like uniform thickness across the field of view. If it's not, you know, it kind of is thicker in some locations and thinner in other locations. And so this allows you to um, optimize the light sheet thickness by basically parking the light sheet or not generating a light sheet at all, just looking at a single beam. Um, 
with uh, in the same medium but without being in the sample you just use the scattered light of your of, of the laser beam and if sounds if this sounds a little bit confusing i can maybe post a um uh, Nikita actually took a, a YouTube video or he created a YouTube video specifically for users to show this. Of course, this is an approach you can only do if you have a microscope that supports this, um, uh, you know, uh, has like a tunable like sweep option. And the other thing is the um, uh, basically uses this rolling shutter mode. So I'm just going to post this video here. I hope that's the correct one. Um, there we go. <clears throat> Okay, I'm happy to take questions from the floor or I'll keep going. <laughs> um, I love those cuvettes that you have there in your in the mesoscope. Um, what uh, things that give us grief in putting things into our um, light sheet is the difference we seem to find um, anything cleared during using clarity like techniques tend to float and the mm -hmm. stuff done with solvents tend to sink. So they're nice and easy to use because they're easy to handle. But I didn't see anything in your cuvettes. How do you hold that sample still, uh, particularly um, with things that float? Yeah, so in the original Mises printer, the, the way we image clarity samples was by attaching a tiny little weight with like super glue to the bottom. Um, so people would construct a weight like out of black aluminum foil or like a little you know, nut or something. And then it would kind of, you know, drag everything uh, to the bottom. Um, for samples with, with, you know, organic solvents, they get dehydrated, they get hardened. Um, we usually clamp them in a little holder. So we don't tend to use cuvettes for that. If people use cuvettes, um, for instance, if it's a sample from like, a, you know, an infectious sample that you want to keep, you know, encapsulated, then we recommend that people, um, basically uh, create like a bunch of agarose blocks and also clear them using the same kind of dehydration procedure. And then you have like a little, you know, basically a little spacer you can put in the on the bottom of the cuvette in order to try to get basically, the channels always get the sample away from the cuvette walls because whenever you're close to the wall, you have like reflections and uh, artifacts. So you need like some way of like, you know, centering it in the cuvette. And so you said, just, just make some agarose spaces. Okay, thank you for that. That's this is it. it different ways to to get around this sample holding because everybody has different samples. Okay, we've got a couple of questions from the uh, the floor. Let's see, uh, Jian, let's uh, activate your microphone. You can ask your question. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm here. There we go. Cool. Uh, well, thanks for this fantastic talk. Uh, we work with really large marmoset brains. And so I was wondering, what is the biggest size sample you can fit in your cuvette? Um, the biggest cuvettes I've imaged in were like five by five by 12 centimeters. Um, but it requires really really good samples of course to be able to go like two centimeters two and a half centimeters into a cleared sample um so i actually have for, for like i mean i've imaged pretty large human brain samples but these were more like slab like and maximum was like a centimeter thick so actually um yeah so i would in, in the case of the mesosperm we would just accommodate it with a large cuvet Thank you. Thank you. And now, uh, Ishka, let me just allow you to talk there. Oh, oh yours, Ishka. <laughs> it's actually Sam. Ishka and I are watching together. Cool. Uh, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. cool. Um, I was just wondering, we've got a program and at the Light Sheet Workshop, we had the CEO of Sci Glass come and show us through that uh, kind of three-dimensional program where you can put on the headset and walk mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you've looked at any of your stuff in that and if you notice a difference with the Schmidt lens versus others. Like for, um, you mean like whether it's like whatever, segmentation is easier or... Yeah, whether you get like better clarity, um, and if you just, I guess, notice the difference. Um, I mean, I, I 
I have not used Scylla's that much for Schmidt data, actually. I mean, I actually recently used a little bit for um, looking at vascular um, data, like vascular data in mouse brain. I mean, the thing is, like, a, um, basically, the um, yeah, the, the resolution of the Schmidt is, like, on a factor of two to three better than the, the, the best what the mesospin can provide. The mesospin is really more like a mid to a lower level resolution system. So if you have like fine processes, you know, spines, um, dendrites, axons, then, you know, Schmidt data is definitely going to look much, much better um, and also be, be easier to segment. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Okay, and a question from Georg. Let me uh, access your. There you are, Georg. Please. Oh yeah, thanks. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, I'm fascinated by the Smith, the Smith uh, objective, and uh, yeah, I mean, we're always interested in. We're more interested in cryo correlative microscopy and so on, and it's always difficult to find objectives that with high NA, long working distance and so on. So I just wondered whether it's possible to push yeah. DNA in air higher than 0 0.7 or what would limit it in that regard? Um, basically, if you're willing to accept a smaller feed of view, then yes. Okay. So so in a, a little bit, the way to think about it too, like this is like that the, if you if you keep the product of NA and feed of view constant, you kind of can, you know, be a little bit on that line. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. So, so if you say you you want to increase the NA by a little bit, so and of course, um, the higher you push the NA, so you, you you basically need to make the the um, you you will need to correct for higher orders of spherical aberration, and so the surface you you the, the surface of this um, correction plate, um, the tolerance has become much tighter. Mm. But basically, it's possible. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you, Georg. Uh, we have no other questions coming in. I one of my one of my favorite things is that anybody can make something more complicated. That benchtop version of the mesospin is a wonderful thing. Oh, you've made it smaller and better. Um, is this was this a year's work? How how does it go from that larger design to that smaller design? Well, I mean, the story of the bench job is actually that um, there was a light sheet meeting in Germany in 2019, and like two weeks before the light sheet meeting, um, Emmanuel Reynaud uh, posted on Twitter whether we want to come and bring a mesospim. And then I said, well, we don't have a, you know, transportable mesospim. Um, and then I was like, okay, there's two weeks, maybe I can build one. And so the first prototype was actually two weeks. Um, just you know put together from parts like leftover parts from like other mesospins. spins um and so it was a bit of a trade-off uh, of course you know things were not like the stages weren't that great and so on and so forth and but then you know, we, um you know we, we exchanged some hardware and of course then there was a huge issue with like covid that you know getting stages getting hardware became you know delivery times became pretty long so even though the first prototype existed quite a while ago took a while also to release and also we tend to have a release cycle where we want to have some early adopters in the field so basically somebody who you know takes the risk of basically building a setup with us like it means Nikita and me not being involved because that's the only way we can kind of test like documentation you know whether instructions work you know there's no other way you know uh, than have somebody actually do it step by step and see if it actually works and so this took a while but now there's like three uh, three bench tops actually uh i believe two in the us one in switzerland and nikita is building the fourth one and i think there's a few more coming up excellent we have one more question from david i'm just allowing you to talk there hi Hi, Fabian. That was really an amazing talk. Um, I have a couple of just quick questions. One is, in terms of how you organize the data flow for this, um, because with the much larger samples, I don't know what the, you, you mentioned briefly, I think in one of them, the size of the files that you generate, but obviously 
Um, if you're increasing the field of view and you're, you're, you're getting large, large samples, you're going to be quickly acquiring huge, huge amounts of data. Do you have your data connected to the software that's driving the mic? Like, how, how do you set this up? Do you have your microscope being driven off like a, 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 like a, like a server or do you have it off a computer and then you send the data somewhere else? Or have you got it all looped together in sort of a closed type of a thing? Yeah, so I would say the good thing about imaging clay tissue is that you only have a single time point. So the data sets is like they're large, but it's not like you have to whatever stream the data because you would run out of you know storage on a on a local workstation. So usually people just have a local workstation. Yeah. And then if they're done imaging, they they shift the data away over the network. Regarding kind of making the whole, you know, I would say I would call it the pre-processing workflow easier. So um, one of the things we what we can do in the mesospin data is we can write HDF5 files that are fully compatible with big stitcher. And so that means that any like multi-view acquisition, but also like a tile pattern, we can load into big stitcher and stitch right away. Okay, and cool. so that's that's one of the ways how we can you know try to make it compatible with like um, you know existing things. One thing one could discuss about is whether to directly write MRS files. Yeah. Um, uh, that would also be possible. Uh, the thing is, it's something we haven't implemented. So we have, of course, a bit of an incentive to stay open source all the way. Yeah. Um, and I would say if somebody in the community wants it, then we would definitely implement it. Yeah, no, that, that sort of leads to the second question. We do have, um, you know, a lab here that's really been, you know, pioneering in Napari. And I remember you mentioned that it was Python based, the, yeah. the commands. Have you ever, have you engaged with any? You know, because um, I'm thinking about how you would, you know, if you were to set this up, obviously you need an, inter you, you've got files that people can download to, to try and drive it, but it would be beautiful if it could be integrated into, you know, something that's open source that's, yeah, everyone can access. And yeah, so have you, have you had any engagement with, with them or, or is this the... the um, yeah, yeah, I see that, that actually Juan is here, so... <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I love Napari, um, and I had discussions with um, a while ago actually with Nick um, Sofroniev. One of the things that was, and I don't know, and I haven't followed up on this, I should say, because I'm a little bit also working on other projects, but one of the things which stopped me a little bit from um, using it that much was have a really fast histogram. For like if you want to use it for like data display do, during acquisition, you want to be able to really have super, you know, fast feedback on, on you know where your pixels fall on your histogram. And I think this was you know was maybe possible with like plugins, but it wasn't. It didn't feel that streamlined. This was the one thing that was a bit you know bugging me. I don't know if that is actually now in your version is totally addressed. And of course, there's actually people. Um, on the top of my head, for instance, there's ImSwitch, like there's packages for data acquisition with microscopes that use Napari as kind of the you know primary, like as one of the UI elements. And we're eyeing this very, very carefully. Um, and at some point we might do that switch. So we definitely see that, uh, you know, Napari, the, the community of course is growing. Um, right now we're still sticking with like PyQt graph for um, um, visualization or like for, for data display. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. All right. We have Juan. Um, uh, you are. No, oh, I've missed. Sorry. Get my mouse work better. There we are. No, it's working. It's working. Um, yeah. Fantastic talk. Um, no, I think I think you've covered it anyway. Uh, I just wanted to sort of pop in, but uh, we also have issues with um, performance for very large data sets, but we're working with those. Um, and anyway, I think, I guess for the UI, you could just downsample, right? You don't need to show the full resolution while you're acquiring. Um, but anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I should, yeah. So so currently we're actually working a lot with like CMOS cameras, which have like 15 megapixels and we just need to subsample. That's absolutely true, yeah. But but yeah. maybe you you know best about like the histogram thing. Is that something actually that's working natively now? Or like... uh, no, <laughs> um, but okay. but we would we would love to get, you know, uh, yeah, if you, if you hop on the repo and uh, and push for that, then uh, I, I it doesn't seem like a, a big problem, I think. Um, so, you know, I, there's no technical reason why we haven't done it. It just hasn't been a priority. Um, yeah. 
it could be done. So so when you say fast histogram, like you you're computing it on the GPU or what what exactly are you doing? Actually, I mean, so the thing is, you know, there's like a histogram you want for like, you know, truly like the thing is actually you might not even need to compute the full histogram. You just need to get an idea of what your pixel distribution looks like. So you could yeah. do some very clever sampling on like, you know, the you know, even subsampled images because you know, if there's like one or two saturated pixels, you don't care. Um, yeah. And and so, but there would be something where you really display speed is, is like the biggest mm. criterion that you, you know, you, you have your data coming in at like, I don't know, you want to display it, let's see, at least 30 uh, FPS. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so you need to have an update on that rate so that if you go to like a different part of your sample that you immediately see the histogram change. Mm. Yeah, no, yeah, maybe maybe we should take this. I mean, I would love to talk about. Yeah, I agree. Drop drop <laughs> me a message and like and 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 also yeah. maybe it's something where I would love to involve Nikita because it's him now uh, pushing, of course, the software more than I do. Sure, cool. Okay, yeah, we can chat later. <laughs> no, but thank you so much, for, and, and and thanks for all the the effort you put into Napari. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much, Fabian. That has been a fantastic talk. As I say, those. Uh, I happily recommend that website. Oh my God, there is so much on that website. It is so good. Uh, hopefully any other questions can be answered on there. There's instructions on how to build it. There's lists for a lot of parts. It's quite, it, it's very thorough. So thank mm -hmm. you very much for your time today, Fabian. That has been fantastic. Um, we wish you all the best and we'll finish yeah. up for now. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, if people have questions, please reach out and um, you know, we, we're happy to help. Thank you so much and have a great day. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.